So Welcome to Marwin was my first opportunity to work with director Robert Zemeckis. And it was one of those moments where, you know, again, you have to kind of remind yourself of where your career has, has taken you, you know, to, to, to look back on it and to remember that the last movie I saw in a drive-in theater in my early 20s before drive-ins were stopped being a thing was a double bill Back to the Future and Ghostbusters. And then to find myself, you know, many years later, working with that director who has this, you know, huge catalog of, of influential films and to now be sitting with him and talking about his latest project and, you know, talking about shots um, was, was just a really thrilling thing. The film was going to be Welcome to Marwin. And it tells the story of Mark Hogenkamp, who, you know, suffered a terrible brain injury after getting assaulted by uh, a bunch of thugs at a bar. And his journey to sort of rebuild himself and, and rebuild his life through stories that he was creating with one six scale action figures. And, you know, Mark, Mark was, was not a professional model maker um, and was also damaged. You know, he used to be a, a, a talented artist and could no longer, you know, hold a pen and, and draw the way that he used to. So this was sort of like phys physical therapy for him was recreating this world. And, you know, so for us, we needed to create the world that Mark had created. And as professional model makers, what we needed to do was not make it look like professional model makers had come in and done all this work. So we created a series of 24 different one six scale action figures. And now these were all made from scratch and were incredibly complex articulated figures that had dollified versions of the, the, the lead actor's faces. We didn't have a lot of time to create these things, to engineer them and they were going to have to stand up to the abuse that you will often find on a film set where, I mean, it's just sort of the day-to-day -day rigors of using these elements. So the, the dolls each were, were incredibly detailed and, and you know, very quickly but very precisely engineered little marvels with, I'm trying to remember how many parts, but there was at least 50 parts in each one of the figures to give them the articulation they needed. And then, you know, so we, we digitally designed them, we 3D printed all the separate parts, we made multi-part molds to cast them all in, in impact-resistant resi resins, and then there was, of course, you know, painting and creating armatures, and all of this work that had to happen in a very short period of time. Uh, and that was just for the dolls. Then on top of that, we needed to make all the vehicles that you see in Welcome to Marwin. So there's uh, an airplane that you see in the opening sequence of the film that goes through a crash landing. There uh, was, was Hoagie's Jeep that he drives around in. There were the German vehicles, the, the uh, you know, different motorcycles and tanks and all of these different uh, elements that you see. And then there were also, or there was also the village of Marwin. And we actually made two identical versions, one that was strictly for use on a studio stage and one that was to go on location at an outdoor location uh, outside of the community of uh, Burnaby in British Columbia, Canada. The interesting thing about the way we built everything was, you know, the dolls were very, very precise, very high precision, very delicate craftsmanship to make these things. But when it came to the village, we had to make it look like it was made by somebody who, who was not a pro. So I basically said to everybody, okay, if you're right-handed, all your work's going to be left-handed. And if you make a mistake, if you're, if you, you're cutting a line and you go off the line, we don't start over again. You work with what you've got to give it that feel of having been created by someone who was working through some things. So we had, uh, I guess, altogether eight or nine weeks to do the fabrication of the villages. We had 11 weeks to do the dolls. Um, and then everything was, was packed up and shipped to Vancouver for filming. And once it was in Vancouver, all of the elements that we made were put through photogrammetry and 3D scanning. So they were using the, the physical assets that we created for live action photography, but they were also using them for all of the shots that were digital. So literally every frame of film that, in, that has the characters in it, the doll characters in it, is either our live action physical asset or it is the scanned version of our live action asset. So basically, end to end, the film is full of all the different elements that we had to make to create both the digital and live action shots. 
I think if you look at the artists in my shop right now, today, and you compare those to artists who were in the field 30 or 40 years ago, you aren't going to find that much difference between them. They are going to be a group of creative problem solvers who have a variety of skill sets that allow them to hand fabricate wonderful little works of art. Now, in today's environment, having a digital uh, skill set certainly is an asset that is nice to have in your tool bag, but it's not a deal breaker. You know, I have artists on, on the team who, who cannot, you know, use a mouse to save their lives, but they're a valuable asset and no more or less valuable than the person sitting beside them. The company doesn't, doesn't rise and fall by our ability to do 3D printing. 3D printing is a great asset and that's why we've invested, you know, somewhat heavily in 3D printing. But that's because they are good tools, just like I've spent good money on, you know, high quality table saws or any other, you know, tool in the shop. It's that it's there to be used to help us get to that end goal of creating a wonderful miniature. And if it's made on the router table or if it's made in the 3D printer, it's just, those are just tools to get us to that end goal of pleasing our client and delivering the best product that we can. So being a digital model maker, Yes. Valuable? Certainly. Essential? Absolutely not.